In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's good to welcome you to Hereford Cathedral for this act of worship. Today our journey through Lent brings us to Passion Tide, and we can see that Calvary is much closer now. In the scripture readings there is a feeling of mounting tension. We sense that the clouds are darkening and the storm is gathering around Jesus. The pace of events is increasing and moving rapidly towards the dreadful climax of Good Friday. So let's begin our worship by opening our hearts to the love that took Jesus to the cross as we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning at the 31st verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord. For they shall know me, and from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us start by making clear what the word passion actually means in a theological context. When most of us think of passion, we think of love, of desire, of romance. The true meaning of passion is, however, different. The true meaning of passion is to suffer, to bear, to endure. It's one thing to suffer and be a victim. It's an entirely different matter to be willing to suffer for a cause and become a victor. There are two themes which present themselves in today's readings. Firstly, Jeremiah's words of covenant. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant. And the connection with that short period at the end of the life of Jesus, prior to his death and resurrection, known as the Passion of Christ. The concept of covenant was not new to the people of the Old Testament, those whom Jeremiah was speaking to. Different biblical commentaries number the covenants that the Hebrew people had made with God. Some put the figure as five covenants, others say eight. I'm not sure numerical accuracy is necessary to understand the idea that God has constantly sought to reach out to his creation and offer salvation. The covenant with Abraham, go to a land that I will show you, and I'll make you a great nation. The covenant with Noah, symbolized by the rainbow. God said, my bow I set in the sky to be a sign of the covenant between myself and the earth, and never again will the waters become a flood to destroy creation. The covenant with Moses, sealed in the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, you will have no other God before me. Thus I will be your God, and you will be my people. A covenant is a binding agreement between two parties in which both sides agree to the terms of reference. In the covenant with Jeremiah, God declares that in this new covenant, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sin no more. All God asks of his people for their part is that they will keep his commandments and statutes and be known as his people. 
Yet time and again in their history, the people stray away from the faith and fail to keep their side of the bargain. God never fails in his side of the bargain. One of our post-communion prayers goes like this. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. That prayer neatly encapsulates the fact that humanity time and again broke the covenant. Yet God, with infinite compassion and understanding, kept seeking ways to renew the covenant with his people, to restore them to a right relationship with himself. The link between the two readings is, of course, brought to fruition in the life of Jesus. Jesus is the means by which God makes his last and final covenant with humanity through the death and resurrection of his only Son. When we talk of Passion Sunday, we are focusing on the end of the life of Jesus which leads to his ultimate death on the cross and resurrection. In the liturgical calendar, it begins the Sunday before Palm Sunday, when events in the life of Jesus seem to suddenly speed up. All the Gospel writers place Jesus in or around Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, that great Jewish festival which records their freedom from slavery at the time of Moses. When their ancestors were instructed by Moses, to kill a lamb and smear its blood on the doors, so the angel of death, which would take the lives of all the firstborn, would see the sign of the blood on the doors, and their firstborn would be spared. Jesus had gone up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover in order to fulfill an ancient prophecy, and in the full knowledge that both the religious and secular authorities were moving inexorably to initiate his demise. This was to be the new and final covenant, that his death and resurrection would seal in his blood one oblation once offered for the salvation of humanity. What must always be borne in mind is gospel writers wrote from the point of resurrection first and then gathered their differing materials in the light of that event. Even a cursory reading of the later chapters of St. John's Gospel make it clear the power of evil was stalking the land. The religious authorities were clearly terrified by Jesus' message of salvation and it was called to the people to repent and to return to the true worship of God. There are many references in this gospel to the chief priests and Pharisees wanting to arrest Jesus. So much so, it became difficult for Jesus to be seen in public. There is a discussion recorded that the religious powers were scared of arresting Jesus in the public arena for fear of the crowds with whom Jesus was very popular. And there was a real fear in the religious authorities that the crowd would turn against them. The high priest, Caiaphas, had his own reasons for wanting to do away with Jesus. He is recorded as saying, you do not realize that it is more to your interest that one man should die for the people and the whole nation should be destroyed. The secular powers represented by Herod the king and Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. They too were equally as anxious about the popularity of Jesus with the people and the message he was giving. Herod saw Jesus as a challenge to his throne and Pilate feared an insurrection of the people. He was terrified of a revolt in the city. What is not recorded in the Gospels, but is in documentary form recorded by the Roman scribes, is that Pius had put down a previous insurrection with such brutality, the emperor had recalled him to Rome and warned him that such a repeat of this brutality would not be tolerated. So we have a fearful king, a fearful Roman governor, and a high priest with dubious motives for wanting to rid the nation of Jesus. Power in the wrong hands is an explosive recipe. What might be termed as the perfect storm was gathering. So desperate were these figures of authority, they even resolved to do away with Lazarus, since on his account, many Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Of course, we have the benefits of hindsight. 
We know that Judas led the authorities to find and arrest Jesus. And in the next two weeks, we'll relive the story. And at the end, stand with those who throughout the ages have accepted Jesus as God's son, whose death and resurrection has sealed in blood the new covenants and restored a right relationship between us and God. The true meaning of passion is to suffer, to bear, to endure. That's the true vocation of all who would call Jesus their Lord and Saviour. Our Christian history, people of the new covenant, is full of saints and martyrs who have suffered, borne, and endured much for Christ. Some acknowledged by being canonised, but many who just quietly and diligently go about their daily life bringing the light of Christ into the lives of others. To conclude the prayer to which I referred earlier, Father of all, may we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. This is the new covenant, which is ours to own and ours to act upon, this day and always. And let us walk these week, two weeks in the way of the cross and stand with him at the resurrection on that joyful Easter morn. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. 
Lord of all life and love, as one of us, you suffered loneliness, temptation, despair, and rejection. As we journey through Lent, we seek your water of life to cleanse and refresh our spirits. Walk with us through our earthly pilgrimage and life's wilderness, loving, supporting, and teaching us how to bless others through service, how to find strength in weakness, and how to experience growth through repentance and letting go for your name's sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that your church here and in every place may offer a living worship to you in your glory and a living witness to the world in its need. In the Anglican community, we ask you to bless and guide Archbishop Justin, our Bishop Richard, Archdeacon Derek Chesney, Rural Dean Guy Wilkinson, and parishes of Kington and Webley Deanery. We also pray for the lay co-chair, Elizabeth Shaler, and for Anne Tunley, the sub-warden of lay readers. We pray for our overseas missions, for their work and dedication. Lord Jesus, Servant King, we thank you today for all whose humble service has enriched our lives and those of our communities. Through modest but real life ways, emulating your life-changing love and goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray for our world in the uncertainty, unrest and unprecedented difficulties of these times, causing suffering, hardship and loneliness for so many people. Guide the leaders of our world with integrity and mercy understanding and compassion as they make decisions for the good of all. Give grace to our government ministers, our queen and royal family, and all in authority. We thank you for the successful and life-saving research and work of scientists in combating the present pandemic and developing vaccines to protect us all. Creator God, who chose in love to make our world, inviting us to share in its care, renewal and nurture. Forgive us for the many wrong choices we have made. And during Lent, guide us as we join with you in the reconciling and healing of all things, as by your spirit, you both renew the face of the earth and also restore us in your own image through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we pray for each other and ourselves, our families, our children, and all involved in education, our friends, and for the strangers we meet each day. We thank you for the many blessings in our lives and for the power of human love. Take pride, selfishness, envy and bitterness from us and strengthen us to serve in response to your love by giving freely to others, without keeping a record, by working hard for others, without counting the cost, and by being a blessing to others, eager to do your will for your name's sake. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Healing Lord, we pray for the many people suffering in mind, body and spirit at this time of great concern throughout the world. And we ask for your blessing on our National Health Service, doctors, nurses, carers and all who support the sick and those in need. Here we remember those who suffer in our own community and in a moment of silence, all who are known personally to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember the recently departed, 
and those whose anniversaries of death occur this week. Among them, Eleanor Aveyard, Maureen Sheldon, Ray Cole, Pat Wilson, Meriel Elizabeth Jancy, Hubert Pitts, Janet Nancy Blair, Eileen Mary Chilcott, Dorothy Phipps and Roy Badman. Open our eyes to see the infinite value of every soul, the supreme importance of every human life and the unique beauty of every individual. May we catch a glimpse of your kindness, mirrored and your love at work in each person with whom we encounter. Comfort and support all who mourn. Thank you for the lives of those who have gone before us. And may the truth and hope of the resurrection help us to live differently, love fearlessly, and lean faithfully on Jesus for whatever lies ahead. Be our strengths in hours of weakness. In our wanderings, be our guide. Through endeavor, failure, danger, Father, be thou at our side. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with us, Lord, in all our prayers, and direct our way toward the attainment of salvation, that among the changes and chances of this mortal life, we may always be defended by your gracious help, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us unite these and all our prayers in the words our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, to take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.